Hello. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us bright and early on a Sunday morning. And I hope everyone is feeling good. Um, I'm Siti Noraisha, your MC for today. Um, today's session is a jointly organized event between Powanit and National University Cancer Institute, Singapore, NCIS. And our specialists uh, will be sharing more about the common health problems among elderly. Before we begin, we would like to remind attendees that your mic has been muted by default. So do type your questions in the Q&A box right below uh, at your Zoom, and we will answer live during the Q&A segment later. Without further ado, let us welcome our speaker of the day, Dr. Natalie Ling, consultant from Department of Geriatric Medicine, National University, of Hosp uh, National University Hospital. Dr. Ling, please. Thank you and good morning to all. Thank you for attending this talk. Um, okay. So today I'll be speaking on the common health conditions in seniors amongst the uh, community. Uh, I am a geriatrician by training from the National University Hospital and I work with NCIS on the geriatric oncology service. Our talk will cover these uh, broad topics. So first I will talk a little bit about aging in Singapore. And then um, some of the common conditions that I'll be going through would include dementia, sarcopenia, and uh, cancer among the elderly, as well as how to screen for them. And at the end, we'll provide some resources that uh, may give further details about some questions that you're um, interested in. So aging in Singapore is on an increasing trend. Um, by 2030, about 25% of our population is expected to be above the age of 65. In comparison to other nations in the world, our population has been aging at a much faster rate. And it, as of 2021, the life expectancy amongst males uh, about, is about 81.1 years, and for females, that's 85.9 years. This increase in life expectancy and an increase in proportion of older adults has profound economic, social, and healthcare implications. Hence, our government and our societies move to include a more um, comprehensive plan for the future to age proof our society. The first condition I'll be talking about that a lot of people are interested in amongst older adults will be dementia. So what is dementia? It is actually a set of conditions characterized by a decline in memory, language skills, problem solving skills such as how to take a bus, how to prepare a fulfilling dinner, attention span, coordination of actions, as well as social interaction with others. The decline in all these functions would affect somebody's ability to perform their daily activities. And these could include things like doing, going to the market, um, handling bills, or even simple things like going to the toilet, bathing themselves, and wearing their own clothes. How common is dementia? Internationally, uh, dementia is estimated to affect about 50 million people worldwide. And this is uh, statistics as of 2018. It is expected to rise to 82 million by 2030 and 152 million by 2050. So it is indeed a pandemic in itself. In Singapore, the well-being of the Singapore Elderly Study conducted by the Institute of Mental Health in 2015 estimated that about one in 10 people aged 60 and above may have dementia. And this approximates the figure to be almost 82,000 people in 2018 and the trend is that it will likely increase to more than 100,000 people in just a few years' time. There are many different types of dementia. Um, the one that we might be most familiar with is this thing called Alzheimer's dementia or Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia that our elderly experience. Vascular dementia, which is dementia related to old stroke problems, is the second most common. And less common forms of dementia include things like Lewy body dementia, which might happen um, in patients with uh, Parkinson's disease, as well as frontal temporal dementia. There are many different stages of dementia, and the severity is often graded according to a person's memory and function. What are some of the signs of dementia? So what most of us are familiar with would be this thing called short-term memory impairment. 
uh, we'll start noticing that our uh, patients suffering from dementia will be forgetting things like medical appointments, even after they've been reminded, uh, forgetting names of new people that they've met, people that uh, have just been introduced to them. They may also be repeatedly misplacing their personal belongings, things like their IC or their wallet. And sometimes we might notice that they get confused with place. Um, let's say they are at Tanjung uh, Katong. Uh, uh, they would think that they are at home when it's not home. Um, and sometimes they will uh, be confused with regards to time. They would think that uh, it is nighttime when it's in fact morning time. Getting lost in familiar places is often also an early sign of dementia. And they may display problems performing daily tasks, such as mixing up familiar recipes that they use to cook, mixing up the medication doses and timing. You might also notice changes in mood, behavior, and personality. And they may also be noticed to start withdrawing from their usual activities and hobbies that they used to enjoy. There are certain complications of dementia, and uh, the most common one that we experience are behavioral and mood symptoms as the disease progresses into the more severe forms. Some of these behavioral mood symptoms include agitation, they get more angry, um, they can have wandering behavior, whether in the home or out in the community, they can have disrupted sleep, they might sleep a lot in the daytime, but they are not able to sleep at night. They may also experience mood symptoms like anxiety and depression. In advanced stages, persons with dementia can develop difficulties with swallowing, walking, and even taking care of their basic needs, such as toileting. Toward the most end stages, persons with dementia may even become bit bound. They eat very little and may only be able to speak very few words. So a lot of people are asking whether or not uh, dementia can be prevented. The evidence on this is actually quite variable. There have been some lifestyle modifications that have been shown to potentially reduce the risk or delay the onset of dementia. And this include education, good control of cardiovascular risk factors, such as high blood pressure, obesity, and diabetes, correction of hearing loss with hearing aids, physical exercise, um, stopping smoking, as well as improved social engagement and interaction. So what do I do if I suspect that I have a loved one with dementia? So the first thing, if you notice that anybody uh, close to you has developed memory problems, um, it will be good to inform their GP or polyclinic doctor, whoever sees them in primary care, who may do an initial evaluation first before deciding whether or not uh, you have to be referred to a specialist for further assessment. After referral, the specialist may speak to you or other caregivers to gather more thorough information about what has been happening with your loved one at home, what are some of the signs and symptoms they've been displaying, and perform a thorough physical examination to make sure that we're not dealing with a medical problem here. The specialist may also perform further blood tests and often a brain scan. In some cases where the history is atypical, then uh, the specialist may offer a neuropsychological assessment, which is done by a clinical psychologist um, with a set of questionnaires that may last about two hours to get a more in-depth uh, view as to what kind of deficiencies our loved one might have. In very special, in some cases, further investigations such as the spinal fluid examination may be warranted. So if you do have somebody with dementia living with you at home, or if you know of somebody with dementia, how best should we care for them? So the one thing we always harp on for dementia-related care is person-centered care. This means to consider the person as an individual with their own unique likes and dislikes, and to also factor in how their personality was like before they developed dementia. And according to this, we do um, things like social engagement, speaking to them about topics they're interested in, conducting activities that they used to love to do. Um, we will also advocate the um, institution of a structured daily routine, meaning give them a proper time to you know, take breakfast, uh, take their baths, go out for a walk, so that they're not confused as of the time of the day and they get used to this routine day in and day out. We also adv advise um, caregivers to pay attention to unmet needs um, this would include, you know, sometimes if they want to go to the toilet, they may not be able to verbalize very well, um, and also whether they are in pain and in discomfort. 
The other um, thing to do would be to optimize the surroundings. Um, so often I advocate my uh, patients' families to think of them like little children. Um, children cannot be overstimulated. They also cannot be understimulated. If not, they will be uh, prone to behavioral outbursts. So in an appropriate timing, just avoid overstimulation. Um, patients, persons with dementia do not like uh, places with too much uh, ambient noise, uh, too many people talking to them at the same time. Also, the other extreme is to avoid understimulation, uh, avoid having them in a situation where they have nothing to do um, and they are just bored around the house, which can exacerbate behavioral problems. Uh, caregivers should also remind persons with dementia regularly of the reality around them. What we find helpful is we, if we display big clocks or calendars in the house to let them know what date it is, what day of the week it is, what time it is. And we also advise uh, family members to put signs around the house so they don't get confused um, with regards to the different parts of the house. So, um, for example, you can label the kitchen and label the toilet, which will help them orientate themselves better. So in terms of medications for dementia, treatment actually depends on the type of dementia, the severity of it, as well as whether there are other medical conditions to count, uh, consider. In our most common type of Alzheimer's dementia, there are two main types of medications, cholinesterase inhibitors and glutamatergic NMDA receptor antagonists. These have been shown to improve memory scores and to help them maintain their independence in activities of daily living. However, we do have to contend sometimes with side effects such as nausea, vomiting, vivid dreams, drowsiness, and a slow heart rate. So patients will all have to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis and to be monitored longitudinally for all these. For vascular dementia, the medications involved usually treat risk factors like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and uh, we also can give them antiplatelets, which are anti-blood clotting agents to reduce the risk of uh, blood clots forming the brain, causing stroke. Medications can also be available for the management of behavioral and mood problems, but because of the side effects that we sometimes encounter with these, such as drowsiness and an increased risk of falls, the benefits of using these must be weighed against it. Many caregivers for persons with dementia have high levels of stress and that puts them at risk of physical and mental health problems. So taking care of our caregivers is also very important to us in geriatric care. There are several tips that um, how caregivers can take note of to cope with uh, caring for somebody with dementia. First of all, taking breaks are important. Okay? Um, similar to caring for a child, you can take a break when um, the person with dementia is having a nap. Or there are also services available such as daycare or day sitters that can give you a bit of respite uh, if you need so. Avoid isolating yourself. Always uh, reconnect with your loved ones, reconnect with your other family members, and sound out if the stress is too much to bear. There are also many support programs available for caregivers with dementia. So community programs like Dementia Day Care, um, where the person with dementia can be uh, situated for a large part of the day so that you can go about your daily activities. There's also the option of respite care to offer relief to caregivers, and these are applicable through AIC with subsidies available. Many support groups and counselling services also exist in the community for uh, caregivers of uh, persons with dementia, and some of these actually also provide caregiver training programs to equip you with skills to care for your charge. Some of the caregiver resources that I briefly uh, alluded to uh, would be Dementia Singapore, the AIC website, and the Dementia Friendly Singapore website, which pro uh, provides very useful tips on care, and Caregiver Alliances Limited, where also they um, conduct many uh, caregiver training courses. The next condition I'll be touching on is sarcopenia. So sarcopenia might not be a term that many people have heard often. Uh, it essentially refers to age-related accelerated loss of muscle mass and function. And uh, this is usually accompanied by reduced muscle strength and physical performance. It affects actually up to about one third of older adults age 60 and above. And common symptoms that a patient with sarcopenia will report include feeling progressively weaker, slowing down in activities, and a general lack of stamina. So people at risk of sarcopenia include anybody of older age, um, people who have uh, low physical activity since their youth, poor nutritional status, um, people with history of smoking, 
and people with chronic illnesses such as uh, lung diseases, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic liver, heart, or kidney disease. How would we know if we have sarcopenia? So we have this questionnaire called the SARC-F, which comprises of five questions that we ask our patients to determine what is their risk or whether it's likely they have sarcopenia. So the first question asks is about strength and whether they have any difficulty in lifting and carrying 10 pounds, which is about a sack of rice, 5 kg. So um, if they answer none, we get a score of zero. Some difficulty, we we'll score them as one. A lot of unable, we we'll score them as two. The second question we ask is about assistance in walking. How much difficulty do you have walking across a room? The third would be how much difficulty they have transferring from a chair or a bed. The fourth question would be how much difficulty do you have to climb a flight of 10 stairs? And the last one would be how many times have you fallen in the last year? So based on the scores we tabulate, uh, a score of more than or equals to four means that sarcopenia is likely and these patients will usually undergo further testing to determine whether they fulfill the diagnostic criteria of sarcopenia. The pictures you see on the right side detail some of the additional tests that we do. So the first picture is a sit-to-stand test. We ask our patients to sit and stand for about five repetitions and we time the duration of time they take to complete this. The picture at the bottom shows a dynamometer, uh, which is something we use to test the strength of their grip. So sarcopenia is very important because it's associated with negative health outcomes, the top one being falls. And we do know that uh, why we're concerned with falls is because it can lead to potential injury like fracture. It is also associated with cognitive decline and memory loss. Uh, functional decline, a reduce in the ability to remain independent in your activities of daily living. It is also associated with an increased risk of death. Sarcopenia is also shown to be related to cardiovascular diseases and increases the related mortality from all these um, illnesses such as diabetes, hypertension, high blood pressure, or hyperlipidemia, which is high cholesterol. How do I prevent sarcopenia then? So the good news is that um, there are ways to prevent it and this actually uh, can start from your youth. So the Health Promotion Board of Singapore actually has physical activity guidelines outlined for adults, which recommends that uh, adults undergo 150 to 300 minutes of at least moderate intensity aerobic physical activity per week. When we talk about moderate intensity, um, this means that you should still be able to hold a conversation, but you may not have enough stamina or strength during the exercise to sing. This can be replaced with 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise if you prefer. Uh, the guidelines also recommend that this aerobic exercise be combined with strength activities about two or more days of the week and to also include multi-component physical activity that emphasizes strength and functional balance at least three days of the week at also moderate intensity or greater. So some examples of the activities that uh, you can partake in uh, is shown in this table here. So aerobic exercises that would include things like brisk walking, leisure dancing or jogging or rope skipping. Strengthening exercises that should take place two times a week at least could include things like Tai Chi, Pilates, or weight training. And multi-component exercises generally also combine aerobic and strength and balance. Um, these would include things like cycling, kayaking, circuit training, racket sports, or swimming. The other way to prevent sarcopenia is through nutrition. So um, since young, we've been advised to take a balanced diet, a balanced diet. A lot of times people don't really understand what a balanced diet is. So the Health Promotion Board has also come up with this helpful My Healthy Plate graphic shown in this slide to um, show what are the proportions of food groups that we should be including in our daily meals. So there's a possible role of nutritional supplements, including things like branch chain amino acids, vitamin D, whey protein, and HMB-enriched milk in preventing sarcopenia. But just nutrition alone is not effective. Uh, it is always advised that this be combined with exercise for effective combating against uh, sarcopenia. 
So the last um, condition I'll be talking about would be cancer in older adults. Why are we concerned? Cancer is often the leading cause of death in Singapore, and older adults are actually more likely to be diagnosed with cancer. Between 2015 to 2019, 73% of all cancer diagnoses in men and 57% of all cancer diagnoses in women were made in people aged 60 and above. The top three cancers in older males include colon, prostate, and lung. And the top three cancers in older females include breast, colon, and lung. What may put one at risk of cancer? So the first thing we usually ask for is a family history of cancer. And for this, we are usually concerned with whether parents or direct siblings um, have a history of cancer. Lifestyle habits such as smoking, alcohol drinking, a high-fat diet, and prolonged sun exposure may also be risk factors. Prolonged occupational exposure to chemicals such as asbestos for patients, uh, for people who used to work in the shipbuilding industry and radiation can also increase cancer risk. And people with past infections such as hepatitis B um, may also be at increased risk. Some symptoms that you may look out for, um, for to see whether or not you need further um, workup and uh, attention for cancer could be significant unintentional weight loss of more than 5% over a six month period. When we say unintentional, it means that you have not been actively restricting your diet, you have not been actively um, doing more exercise than usual to undergo, uh, um, to, to undergo weight loss. We also advise patients to look out for the appearance of lumps and growths over body parts. Um, this would include things like the breast, the skin. These lumps, contrary to popular belief, may not actually be painful. So if you do notice that something is growing at a quite fast rate, um, then it is appropriate to seek medical review. Change in bowel habits, such as discovering blood in your stool, um, discovering alternating constipation and diarrhea, or noticing that your stools have changed in shape to become more thin and elongated, could also warrant further workup. Other symptoms include blood and phlegm. Usually this is also associated with some uh, chronic cough, uh, yellowing of the eyes or the skin, and a sudden increase or very gradual increase in the size of your abdomen. So when detected early, cancer can actually be curable, hence the importance of cancer screening. The Health Promotion Board um, launched this national screening program known as Screen for Life, catering to Singaporeans and permanent residents, where citizens can pay as low as uh, $0 to $5 for cancer screening. This program covers cervical, breast, and colorectal cancer screening for people above the age of 50, and is available at all major polyclinics, CHAS GP clinics, as well as the Singapore Cancer Society. So for cervical cancer, screening is generally recommended for sexually active females aged between 25 to 69. This would include a human papilloma virus, a HPV test, every five years if you're aged 30 and older. If you're of the younger age group, 25 to 29, um, they would do a pap smear because that is more accurate. For breast cancer, screening is actually recommended for women aged 50 to 69. Um, mammogram every two years would be performed. For younger patients between 40 to 49, uh, it's encouraged that these individuals seek a review with their primary care physician to discuss about the pros and cons of screening. And if decided to go for screening, uh, these, uh, these patients will be recommended with a mammogram every year. For colorectal cancer, uh, screening can either be done through a fecal immunochemical test where you test your stools for blood once a year or a colonoscopy procedure that is done every 5 to 10 years for individuals after the age of 50. Certain high-risk individuals such as those with a very strong family history of colorectal cancer or certain genetic syndromes would be recommended to go for a colonoscopy. 
So information on the Screen for Life program, as well as more details on how each individual screening test is conducted, is actually available on the Health Hub website um, with very nice infographics to uh, explain further. So what happens if I do, unfortunately, get diagnosed with cancer? Usually, um, you will first seek treatment again at your polyclinic or your primary care doctor. And then further assessment and treatment will be referred and carried out at a specialist centre with an oncology service. Most of the time, uh, patients will undergo a biopsy to characterise the tumour cells and also further scans to stage the disease to see whether this has only affected a single organ or whether this has spread to other places in the body. Treatment options may include surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy, or a combination of all these modalities. In the ANSYS, we have a geriatric oncology service where we um, get the help of also other specialist nurses, uh, pharmacists, physiotherapy, occupational therapists, um, and our social workers and dietitians in order to optimize uh, medical, physical, and psychosocial issues that could come up along cancer treatment. What do I need to take note of if I'm undergoing cancer treatment? So the very first thing we want to harp on is adequate nutrition. This is because uh, malnutrition or poor nutrition is associated with poorer outcomes, including um, less likelihood of completing treatment and increased mortality. So during your cancer journey, we advise you to speak to a dietitian to formulate a nutritional plan. A dietitian will also be able to counsel on the appropriate foods that you should take or you should avoid during treatment. The second thing is to maintain physical activity. Exercise recommendations for older adults with cancer actually do not differ from the usual population. Hence, the 150 to 300 minutes of um, aerobic exercise recommendation still stands. But of course, the key is to do it as your body tolerates it. It has been shown to improve function and quality of life for patients during and after treatment. And it also increases the likelihood of treatment completion, faster return to pre-treatment health, and improved survival. The other thing is to take note of medications. Uh, many traditional or herbal medications interact with medications used for cancer treatment. So if you are keen to start new medications or you do have medications that um, have been taken since the past, always speak to your oncologist or primary doctor about them. So just to summarize our talk, um, aging is inevitable. All of us are going to grow old but disability and the need to depend on other people um, is actually not. It is never too late to invest in your health and mental well-being, and a lot of the efforts at inducing healthy aging actually starts from youth. There are many illnesses that are diagnosed in old age, but they can still be adequately treated to allow a maintenance of a good quality of life. Hence, the important thing is to take note of what things yeah, you might be afflicted with and also to speak to your primary care doctor. So these are some useful resources that you can uh, refer to. Um, Health Hub is a very big useful resource where they provide guidelines on chronic disease management. Um, these include things like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. They also provide caregiver resources as well as support groups. The Agency for Integrated Care, or AIC, um, provides caregiving resources, details on community services, as well as financial assistance. And the National Silver Academy website um, has uh, information on active aging activities, several causes, and volunteering opportunities, which is especially, especially helpful for uh, people who have retired looking for activities to partake in. Okay, so thank you. I will take any questions now. Thank you, Dr. Ling. Okay, so now we'll move on into um, the Q&A session of today's um, session. And uh, for everyone, do feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box seen at the bottom of the Zoom control panel. Yeah, okay, so Dr. Ling, we have one question now. The question is, how do we as a community tackle the situation where health, loneliness, mental health, and social isolation that our silver generation is facing? 
Thank you for the question. So that's very important. I think um, this is something that we have been grappling with even before the pandemic happened. And now that COVID-19 is on our shores, uh, we have an increasing number of uh, older adults who are um, complaining of uh, uh, loss of social isolation and hence uh, triggering lots of mental health issues. So this needs to be addressed on many levels. Um, first of all, on a personal level, I think um, most of the time speaking to families, um, a lot of uh, problems that our older adults face are just casually brushed off as a byproduct of aging. So that's the first misconception that we want to change. Um, we want to make sure that families are um, pay attention to when their older parents or their older relatives need help. Hence this talk outlining what are the common symptoms to look out for. And also to seek medical treatment when you feel that something is amiss so that um, all these symptoms can be addressed early. Once these are made known to professionals, then the um, help can all fall into place. This might require medications, this might require supportive counselling from our social workers. And at the society level, I think we are moving towards a more age-inclusive society. Retirement age is increasing. There are many opportunities presented for older adults to upgrade their skills and look for meaningful employment. Um, there are also many uh, initiatives to bring together older adults, such as share report programs, where older adults in the community are encouraged to come together, have meals, uh, and uh, perform activities with each other. So all these will need to be um, carried out sustainably and uh, in the long term. And this also uh, requires the help of volunteers in the community to actively participate in these programs. Yeah. So I hope I've answered your question. Okay, that's the next question is, um, is there a link between loss of muscles and loss of bone mass? Mm. Okay, so um, there is supposed to be a link, okay. So um, loss of muscles, as we earlier talked about, sarcopenia. Patients with sarcopenia also are the uh, type of patients who are at higher risk of loss of bone mass, which is osteoporosis, the other common conditions that a lot of older adults face mainly because like lack of exercise and poor nutrition also underlie the pathophysiology of uh, osteoporosis. So usually for older adults, we um, try to screen for both conditions as well. Osteoporosis also is a condition that we uh, tend to look out for very much in our clinical practice. Mm, okay. All right. And then we have another one from a family. Um, what are the statistics in Singapore for dementia? And if there are any supplement or nutrition food to minimize or to prevent dementia? Okay. So um, earlier we shared about the WISE study in Singapore. Uh, in about 2018, the approximation of uh, dementia prevalence is about 1 in 10 older adults above the age of 60. And this is likely to increase. Um, regarding prevention of dementia, the verdict is still out there. There have been um, many studies into supplements such as souvenir, uh, ginkgo, whether or not these actually reduce the risk of some, somebody who has normal mentation developing dementia. But all these studies are actually quite inconclusive. So there is no major food group or major supplement that we'll recommend to prevent. Uh, the main way that uh, we advocate our uh, patients as well as our families to reduce the chances of getting dementia will be to um, partake in an active, healthy lifestyle with uh, physical activity, uh, good nutrition, um, uh, following the healthy plate and ensuring that you get proper nutrition for all your meals and also to um, control your underlying medical problems such as high blood pressure and diabetes. All right, um, we have more, a lot of questions coming in. The next one is, would yearly health checks suffice if, uh, to ensure that you are free from any health issues or is there any other area that we should look into? Okay, so yearly health checks definitely are a good starting ground because um, most of them, we also need to understand that health checks, they have a specific number of conditions they screen for. Um, not everything, unfortunately, can be screened for. So... Um, things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, they are very easy to pick up from tests and all that. But if somebody doesn't manifest the symptom, um, sometimes there's no universal set of uh, health tests that can, that can screen for everything under the sun. 
So the main thing is also to also pay attention to your body conditions day in and day out. If you do feel unwell in a certain place, or you feel um, um, that there's a certain abnormality of your body that you'd like to check out, then it's always good to escalate that to your primary care physician. All right, I think this one is with regards to sarcopenia. What type of exercise to prevent sarcopenia for a person with walking disabilities, for example, those who are wheelchair bound? Mm, that's a very, very good question. Yeah. So we do know that um, wheelchair bound patients may not be able to do weight bearing exercises, but upper body exercises are still very um, important. So what I usually tell my patients is to do, procure an uh, exercise band. These are actually available in most uh, major sports shops in Singapore. And to do repetitions of uh, pulling, extending uh, uh, um, strength exercises to maintain upper body strength. Lower limb exercises, if let's say you can't walk for longer distance, um, cycling on a cycling machine, those static cycling uh, uh, equipment will also be helpful in improving your range of motion and also some strength if you can add a little bit of resistance to it. There are actually a lot of resources on um, exercises available also, I think, on the Health Hub website. And also there are a lot of, uh, increasingly, I find that there are a lot of uh, elderly friendly TV programs, uh, which talk about all these as well. Yeah. So we are not like uh, bound to just, um, you know, uh, even though you are like desk bound, no, we can do some exercises, right? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay, I think uh, we're moving on to some nutrition aspect of the questions. There's one that say, uh, hold on, yeah. If, what's the effect of having to eat um, half boiled eggs? Every, half boiled Have every day. Yeah, I think that he's asking about the nutrition and if there's any effects um, just eating half boiled egg every day. Okay. Um, okay, half boiled eggs is a sensitive issue. <laughs> okay, I would actually usually advocate my patients to eat hard boiled eggs, fully cooked, well cooked eggs. Main thing being that um, we do have patients who have um, uh, conditions that reduce their immunity. Um, and especially because I sit on the geriatric oncology service, a lot of my patients undergo chemotherapy, which weakens their immune system. So in these situations, we don't want them to be taking food that is not properly cooked or fully cooked for fear of infections that can happen. Um, so hard boiled eggs is what I usually advocate. And the point of it is because an egg contains a very significant amount of protein. Um, as somebody grows older, um, sometimes they are afflicted with things like dental issues, they may not be able to chew properly, hence when we ask them to eat meat for protein, um, they cannot take a lot. So eggs are one of those things that are easy to chew, easy to mix into your daily food intake, and hence that provides a lot of protein that you need for the day. So it's hard boiled, not half boiled. I would usually say hard boiled. <laughs> Okay, okay. So just like you were saying about um, the elderly and, and you know and also the um, healthy plate and things like that. Another nutrition um, question is: as one age or you know you go elderly, is there a need to reduce um, one's food intake? Okay, so um, it's not necessary to reduce food intake as you grow older. Um, a lot of times, actually, older adults face problems eating because I mentioned they have dental issues, for example. Uh, they may not be as active as they were when they were younger, so they feel hungry less. And also sometimes uh, because of an a, a abnormal taste, abnormal smell, um, they don't find food palatable anymore. But there's still, um, it's still important to ensure that they eat the major food groups a day and the healthy plate is a good guide to approximate, you know, how much of their shares should be carbohydrates, protein, and vegetables. Um, I would not advocate for a deliberate reduction in the amount of food an older person eats. In fact, the important thing should be ensuring that they still get proper nutrition from all the food groups. So you still go back to the half quarter quarter. Mm, yeah. Yeah, all right. But of course, sometimes they say they can't stomach a full meal at one sitting. Then we will advise them to break it up into six small meals uh, to get their nutritional requirement for the day as well. Okay, all right, that's good. And then um, there's one that asks for the differences between dementia and delirium. Okay, so um, 
Delirium, strictly speaking, is uh, something that comes on quite acutely and we tend to see a fluctuation in things like their alertness, um, their confusion. So one moment they are perfectly okay, the next moment they are very confused, they don't know where they are. And um, oftentimes this delirium is uh, in association with an acute medical problem. So they could be undergoing an infection, they could be in pain, uh, it could be the effect of some medications. Usually, once we address the underlying um, medical problem, the delirium gets better. And dementia, however, on the other hand, is a more chronic uh, disease, a chronic illness um, that lasts throughout months to years and progressively declines over time. So this dementia never quite reverses itself. There are also situations where they overlap. We do know that patients with dementia are more prone or at higher risk of getting delirium when they have a minor insult, such as an infection. So somebody with dementia who has mem mem uh, memory problems may be uh, cruising along quite okay, then suddenly one day you find that you know, they are more agitated than usual, uh, more uh, confused than usual, unable to sleep for three days in a row. Um, that's when we consider that maybe delirium has been superimposed on the condition and we should really be looking out for whether there's an acute medical insult. Okay, so I think, um, all right, this is one question that I think a little can be controversial, so not so controversial, but um, commercial in a sense. They ask, doctor, through your experience, that uh, does essential oils or aromatherapy help in dementia person with mood swing alongside medication? So interestingly, some patients it does, okay? Um, we do know that certain essential oils uh, induce relaxation, induce uh, um, calmness. So um, if, let's say, the family members are keen to try it, uh, there's no real contraindication to it, yeah. We do have family who feedback that. Um, they, they try that with good effect. Oh, okay, nice. Mm -hmm. And then um, this is also about mood. Um, how do you manage behavior issue, for example, violent, irritable, um, of a person who has dementia? Okay, so the first thing is to see whether or not, um, okay, violence, there's a range. Definitely, if they are doing things like picking up knives, threatening to hurt people, um, very uncontrollable and the situation is unsafe, then I would always advocate to either call for the ambulance so that um, the individual can be brought to a medical institution for further treatment. If it's not, not um, something of this severe extent, then usually what we advocate is to see what exactly is triggering off this behavior. Sometimes it's from um, simple things like, you know, asking them to do something at a time what they refuse to do. So some of the feedback I get is like, okay, when I ask my dad to bathe in the morning, he gets very agitated and starts throwing things. Um, so what I would usually counsel is that maybe just find a time where he's, you think his mood is a little bit better. Some patients, they feel better after they've had breakfast. Some patients, they feel better after they've had lunch. So maybe time, the bath time, which is the trigger for the violence and agitation at a timing where their mood is a little bit better. And always, always in these situations, avoid um, direct engaging with them. Um, I think it is inevitable that some behaviours do trigger frustration in us, trigger you know, strong reactions in us as well. But if we were to go hit in and argue and, and force the person to do what we want them to do or force the person to calm down, um, it might actually escalate the ag agitation and aggression. Yeah. Hmm, okay, still on the question of dementia, doctor. Um, they say that, can you please elaborate more on the social engagement? Okay, so um, like we talk about during dementia care, um, person-centered care is what we always advise. Um, and person-centered care considers how this person was like before uh, the memory problem set in. For example, if this person was a gardener, um, he probably liked plants, he probably liked going out in nature, exploring his surroundings. And then engagement and social engagement really focuses on that aspect. Perhaps some things that you know would improve their mood and improve their uh, awareness of the environment would be if you can take daily walks downstairs um, and, and, and speak to them about you know, the plants that you see. He might have a lot of insights to offer because his long-term memory in dementia usually is unaffected until the very end. 
So um, basing your type of engagement on what kind of person he is, what's his personality and what his likes and dislikes were would be very uh, helpful to, to engage them. Other forms of social engagement can be as simple as, you know, bring them down to the void deck uh, such that they see neighbours who they have known all their lives and they can hold a conversation with them rather than having them at home cooked up in, um, uh, between four walls uh, and a TV that they do not understand. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think this is another question on nutrition, back to nutrition, <laughs> about the overconsumption and the um, what do you call that? underconsumption. You say, are there any effects of overconsumption of food for an elderly? And if let's say the elderly eats very little, so and with the amount of medication um, one takes, will the medicine work well with his uh, this little amount of food that he or she takes? Okay, um, so overconsumption, uh, similar to younger patients, younger adults, uh, we do not advocate for somebody to overeat, meaning, you know, it could have the, uh, similarly, it could worsen things like diabetes control, blood pressure control, if we do not keep to a healthy diet. But if they are eating, you know, three main meals and um, a, a normal portion for each main meal, then that shouldn't be an issue. Um, sometimes when we find that our older adults like to snack a lot more, we either encourage families to change them to uh, healthier snacks or um, in the case of people with dementia who cannot really be reasoned with sometimes, uh, we would advise families to keep these snacks out of reach or in a different location so that they cannot find it. Yeah. Um, sorry, the second part of the question was uh, medications as well as uh, whether it would be affected by reduced food intake. Um, for most medications, um, this would not affect the uh, uh, reduced food intake, would not affect the absorption. Uh, the relationship is, in fact, another kind where sometimes if we are dealing with an older person with very bad appetite, we will look through the medications to see, you know, are any of these medications affecting their appetite? This is again very pertinent in our older cancer patients who tend to have poor appetite when they're going through chemotherapy. So we will look through the medications, things that they do not need anymore, do not provide any meaningful benefit at this stage in their life. Uh, we will try to reduce it so that um, you know, their appetite is kept better for food. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another topic on dementia. Is there any, I think I believe you have shared this, but um, there's a question, is there any support groups for the caretakers of dementia patient? Mm. So there are variable, uh, there are various uh, 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 care support groups. I think earlier I shared some of them. Uh, dementia Singapore is one of the very big uh, resources that you can turn to. Um, there are also things on AIC, uh, which can direct you to the um, uh, uh, support groups available, caregiver training courses available if you are taking care of somebody with dementia. Um, there's also a dementia-friendly Singapore website. Um, I can flash the slide again if you don't mind. Just let me show. So these are just a minute now. Sure. Yes. So this is the slide that we earlier alluded to. So Dementia Singapore, uh, AIC website, Dementia Friendly Singapore website, and Caregiver Alliance Limited. Um, they do all have uh, some details on uh, caregiver training programs, uh, caregiver support groups that you can join if you are taking care of somebody with dementia. Sure. I think um, those who's um, asking this question, you might want to take a screenshot of um, the helpline there. Yeah. Another one is, is pap smear test necessary for women after 50 years or example after 60 years? And if there's no need for the test, will these older women be exposed to cervical cancer? Okay, so why we have um, age limits on certain screening tests is because it's been shown that either beyond this age, the risk of developing um, this, this cancer as a new cancer is lower or the test is not um, very effective at picking up uh, the presence of cancer beyond a certain age. 
Okay, so um, that's not to say that the moment you turn 69, we do not screen you and we do not want to test you for cervical cancer anymore. If there are symptoms such as, you know, bleeding um, vaginally um, when you're older, when you're postmenopausal, all these symptoms, if you report it to your primary doctor, you will still be investigated and you might still undergo um, testing for cervical cancer based on what your doctor has evaluated. Screening is done um, when, let's say, somebody has no symptoms and then they're just doing the screen just to pick it up at the earlier stage. And for cervical cancer, it's one of those uh, uh, diseases that tend to be um, afflicting younger women and um, are more readily picked up in all those tests when you are of a younger age group. All right. Um, to dementia, there's one that asks, some people who has dementia, like you said just now, may experience day and night confusion. I think you have talked a little bit about that just now. Or get mixed up and they tend to sleep in the day and stay awake at night. So how do you manage and help them to adjust back to the normal routine? And in many cases, um, these elderly live with their family members, like children or grandchildren, and they're working or schooling. So it can be disruptive and affecting everyone in their daily life. So yeah, they would like to know a strategy. How do mm, you okay, so this is a very good question. Um, most of the time, why people sleep a lot in the daytime is because they are not engaged. They are not, um, they don't have anything to do in the day. Okay, so uh, it's, it's like if a kid is very bored, they will get, they will find their own means to do things. And most of the time, older adults, they don't really have many means to do things, so they just sleep. Um, there is no fast trick to resolving this. It does take some time. So what we will advocate is to try bit by bit to encourage them to wake up at a certain time of the day. And instead of just leaving them to their own devices, structure activities throughout the day, um, which will keep them awake. So this can be simple things like asking them to fold the laundry, bringing them down for a walk. Um, one very good way that I always advise my patients to, to consider is to bring them for daycare. So at daycare, they have volunteers, they have um, other older adults where they can talk to, the volunteers will um, and, uh, organize activities such as karaoke, uh, presentations, you know, chit chat about Singapore in the past. And this is just a very effective way of keeping them awake, alert throughout the day. Um, and so that towards the end of the day, they are more tired, they are more conditioned for sleep. Yeah, sometimes what helps is also uh, before nighttime um, to take a warm bath. Uh, just now we had a, a, a person ask about essential oils, put in some essential oils so that it facilitates them getting into a, a state that's ready for sleep. And also to make the bedtime environment conducive, a dark room away from noise and interruptions, uh, making sure that they don't spend too much time in the bedroom they're supposed to sleep in uh, during their awake hours just before bed so that they can associate the bed and bedroom with sleep purely. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is uh, quite appropriate because I think we're about to end the session. The last question is uh, probably a wrap up is what is the earliest sign and remedy for dementia? So earlier we shared about some of the um, early signs of dementia. I think the first um, most common sign that a lot of people report is that they tend to forget things that they are told. So for example, let's say we tell them that, oh, tomorrow evening we're going for dinner. The next minute or tomorrow comes around and they say that, oh, I, I don't know that we're going for dinner. You know, I don't remember all this. Or um, sometimes we find that they repeat um, their questions a lot. For example, uh, have you eaten? And then in another half an hour, they ask, have you eaten? Yeah, so this may already trigger some um, concern that they have uh, short-term memory uh, loss. And early remedies for dementia. So um, what we do advocate is if you do feel or do suspect that your loved one has dementia, always raise it up to their primary care doctor who may refer them to a specialist. So usually um, as geriatricians, as neurologists, we see patients with early dementia. And uh, if necessary, we will start them on medications to reduce the risk of this progressing. Okay. Um, other things would be, you know, earlier we talked about social engagement, making sure they have a routine structured activity uh, to follow, uh, ensuring that the other um, medical conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure are uh, kept under good control and ensuring they have uh, adequate nutrition. Thank you so much, Dr. Ling. I think we, we might have answered all the questions 
for today. And then we are approaching, so we are soon approaching the end of the webinar. So um, we hope that it had been an insightful session for everyone. And once again, a huge thank you to our speaker, Dr. Ling, and to everyone who is, um, is attending this session. Um, so do help us to fill up a feedback form, which you will be redirected to after you leave the webinar. And alternatively, you may scan the QR code shown on the slide now and uh, click on the link in the chat box to assess the form. And do keep a lookout for upcoming events by ANSYS. And I think, oh, hold on, yeah. Yeah, and thank you, Dr. Ling, for the great presentation and sharing. So if you see the QR code now, you can actually um, you know, scan it to do a feedback. Or I think someone has shared um, the link. Yeah, the link for the feedback. Yeah, so everyone, thank you so much and have a lovely Sunday. Thank you. Thank you.